Our whole lives we have been told, brush your teeth twice a day, see a dentist regularly, and floss if you don't want your teeth to fall out of your head. Brush your teeth twice a day, that's the way to fight decay. Floss your teeth once a day, helps remove that crap away. Hey, hey. Brushing our teeth is a ritual so ingrained in our everyday life that we don't even think about it. And yet, it's far from the be-all, end-all of oral health. There's a whole different side of things that nobody ever talks about, so we're gonna get into it. You might be tempted to think that toothpaste is a relatively modern invention, but while that familiar mass-produced Colgate tube has only been around since 1890s, toothpaste has existed in one form or another since at least 3000 or 5000 BC. The ancient Egyptians would use weird shit like ox hooves, eggshells, and pumice, mix it with a bit of water or saliva, and rub it against their teeth for the moderate effect of cleaning things up in there, while also keeping away any prospective mates. Ancient Greeks, Romans, and Chinese also had similar practices. Some old school ingredients may be a little unexpected. Like apparently, urine has some teeth cleaning properties, which is something I never wanted to know, and probably neither did you, but here we are. But other than a few cringy details, you might actually notice some pretty familiar trends from back in the day to right now. The key then, as it is now, is to find some sort of abrasive substance to scrape the gunk off of your teeth, and then to find something to cover up the flavor of whatever you just used. Probably herbs or spices, you know, like mint, the time-old breath freshener for a literal millennia. Some of these ancient oral hygiene routines wouldn't necessarily feel all that different from ours, except for one key thing. They were pretty much only available for the rich until the 1800s. In 1873, Colgate started mass producing paste in jars, soon after that in tubes, and then added all sorts of weird chemicals to create the widely accessible minty fresh paste that we all know today. It is socially expected for you to brush your teeth at least once or twice a day which is like a bare minimum for oral hygiene. 307 million people in the United States, over 90% of the population, used toothpaste in 2020, and it's now a $30 billion industry. This is the normal. We all do it. It's just a generational thing that we've been doing forever, and we just keep doing it. But here's the thing. Despite the ancient origins of tooth care rituals, humans survived for millions of years, even before then, without doing any of this. And most of humanity still didn't have access to it for much of the last few millennia, unless they were really well off. Then there is the 10% of Americans who apparently still don't use toothpaste, which is crazy to me. And it has us wondering, is toothpaste really necessary. What I find actually insane is that many of our pre-toothpaste ancestors apparently had better teeth than us modern folk. But it wasn't the brand of toothpaste that kept their mouths intact, but rather what they ate. These groups had a radically different diet, not just from us contemporary folk, but from any agricultural society throughout history. Instead of growing their own food, they would hunt and forage huge swaths of land, collecting anything edible, which ended up being mostly meat, vegetables, and nuts. And these didn't have all these fancy tools and processes that we do to make them into processed food. With no mills to grind wheat into flour and what have you, the food they ate ended up being naturally more fibrous and harder to chew, which may helped clean teeth by stimulating saliva production and gently scraping away plaque as they ate. But on top of this, they were usually eating very low carb diets, with the exception of at least one group living in Moroccan caves somewhere that basically just ate so many acorns that their teeth retired early. But for the most part, it is not the easiest thing to find as a forager. There isn't Skittles just growing on trees out in the middle of the wilderness. And it turns out that carbs and sugars are kind of like the worst thing 
for your oral health. Who would have guessed? Now we're gonna get a little sciency and we are going to get into the toothpaste soon, but bear with me here. Basically, sugar and starches feed the plaque in your mouth, which is just a sticky film of bacteria on your teeth that releases acid when fed. This acid then goes on to eat the minerals in your tooth enamel, causing tooth decay and opening up the doors to cavities and disease. But if you're living off of berries in the woods, plaque isn't nearly as big of a deal. These bacteria don't produce acid unless fed, and for the most part, these foraging societies simply didn't find enough carbs for this to be a real concern. Side note, do you get those like plaque cleaning videos on TikTok where they're just like busting up some poor sucker's mouth and it's just like one of those transformational things? They're hard to watch, but you can't stop watching. You know what I mean? And then about 12,000 years ago, the idea of farming started taking over the world. While this enabled many wonderful things, such as the ability to settle down and build cities, the Neolithic or agricultural revolution created some significant downsides. One of which being the beginning of what is known as the Age of Cavities. If you were a tooth back then, it seemed like there was an all-out war on your kind and nobody was going to survive. At this point, people started eating more carbs, more processed foods, and less diverse diets in general. Without the low-carb, fibrous diversity of their hunter-gatherer ancestors, these farmers were unintentionally overfeeding the bacteria in their mouth and destroying their teeth. Now here's a little bacteria lesson. We're not quite done with the science yet. Bacteria plays a critical role in general for helping us digest our food and keeping our body functional at all. However, these bacteria need to be in the right balance. Different species thrive off different foods, which is one of the things ancient hunter-gatherers had a huge advantage with. They ate such a massive variety of foods that it would have helped their microbiomes keep themselves in check. One of the last remaining hunter-gatherer groups in Africa, the Hadza, eat about 600 different species of plants and animals a year and have some of the most diverse microbiomes on the earth. Unlike the rest of us who basically look at the food pyramid as like carbs, fat, and sugar. The industrial food system is messed up in so many ways and one of the many things that it has produced is an overemphasis on a few things that have become commodities. Namely, potatoes, rice, corn, and wheat. These carby foods feed one special series of bacteria in particular called streptococci, streptococci. To us. Apparently this thing is known as like the main contributor to tooth decay and cavities. Basically we've been training and arming a militia that is hell bent on destroying our teeth and then using toothpaste to fight them off. And it's actually way worse than that. Bacteria imbalance affects pretty much every system in our bodies and I know we're getting really in the weeds here but it is important. This overabundance of harmful bacteria puts our mouths in a constant state of disease. So we're basically living with a permanent immune response, which opens up all sorts of problems, including diabetes, heart attack, cancer, and dementia, which really puts a dampener on the Cheetos, if you know what I mean. And it's stuff like this that makes the paleo movement seem a lot more logical. As we learn more about how our modern diet is affecting us, a subset of the population has responded to this by adopting a more Stone Age style lifestyle. They're ditching processed foods and especially sugary foods in favor of stuff that was more available when we were at the dawn of humanity. The idea here is to go back to what our bodies were built for rather than these modern diets. And I'm sure if you asked a paleo person, they would say that it's the best thing that they've ever done. But for the rest of society, we're probably just gonna keep eating our junk food and brushing our teeth. So what is the deal? The reality is that unfortunately, so many people have been eating this way for so many generations that the whole biodiversity of our mouths and bodies is so different from the Stone Age societies that even to go back to that, we probably wouldn't be able to solve all of our problems. So we have a modern need for professional dentistry. And yes, we are finally back to toothpaste. If you are eating anything that resembles the modern American diet, you probably don't want to go even a single day without scrubbing your teeth with some sort of fluoride-based chemical-intensive toothpaste product. 
These products are designed not only to remove plaque, but strengthen your enamel, polish and freshen things up, and overall just keep your teeth resistant to decay. And to do this, they typically use a few key ingredients. And yes, before you go run into the comments, we are going to talk about fluoride. Fluoride is perhaps the most significant and controversial active ingredient in toothpaste today. Basically, it's the Achilles heel of plaque and any civil conversation around tooth care. It's a mineral found naturally in our bones and teeth and soil and air that prevents the growth of bad bacteria. But it also does have some potentially deadly side effects if ingested in the wrong way. See, fluoride slows down and even reverses tooth decay and in high enough doses actually remineralizes your teeth. Fluoride was introduced to the world of oral care in 1914 and by the late 50s and 60s, it became standard use in dental products. Many municipalities have even started putting it in the water supply so that we get a little oral hygiene just by sipping a glass of tap water. And dentists frequently insist that their patients make sure that they're using toothpaste with fluoride in it. Now, it is safe, undoubtedly, in small doses, and it is present in many natural substances like tea that no one else is worried about, but it is undoubtedly really, really bad for you in large doses. Fluoride has been linked with skeletal or gastrointestinal issues, including arthritis when overused chronically, or even cardiac arrest with a severe overdose. Oh, oh, call an ambulance, call an ambulance but not for me. Which is why fluoride containing toothpaste often have warning labels reminding you not to swallow this stuff. So the real debate that occurs when people start yelling about fluoride is usually some version of how much is too much. Is toothpaste enough to push us over that safe limit? It seems that there is evidence cited for both sides. While the prevailing wisdom is that fluoride is safe in the doses we're typically exposed to, opponents aren't too keen on the possible risks, especially given the toxin-laden world that we now live in. And particularly when it comes to small children too. From soaps and shampoos to cleaning products and air fresheners to the very food that we eat and the medications that we need to keep going, the average person is exposed to an insane number of chemicals that in tiny doses aren't in a huge concern, but when they are constantly being piled on top of each other can get to be a problem. For many people, toothpaste is just another one of those things to be careful with. Not just because of the fluoride. Even if that itself isn't a huge issue, your typical toothpaste contains a number of other contentious ingredients that are far from natural. Colorants, preservatives, thickeners, foaming agents, and get this, artificial sweeteners. Yeah, like sugar. This pharmacy of add-ons carries with them the potential for wreaking all sorts of havoc on our body and even on the environment over time, especially in conjunction with all the other chemical-laden stuff that we're exposed to. But the best part, no matter what the tube says, from sodium lauryl sulfate to hydrogen peroxide to titanium dioxide, ask any dentist and they'll tell you that they're all pretty much the same. Maybe they've got some cool colors, or maybe they have a nifty flavor, but the reality is they're still the same concoction, just in a different tube. And this tube is probably overpowered. It's kind of like bringing the Hulk in to take care of your plaque. He does a job, but not without a whole bunch of collateral damage along the way. So you don't like the chemicals, so now you're gonna go the natural route. Well, what? does that mean? You may have noticed all sorts of natural toothpaste popping up, often, although not always, advertised without fluoride in them, and frequently listing a whole bunch of other things that are not in their paste. These brands tap into growing chemical anxiety with the promises of safe, healthy, and effective oral health care that won't leave you on a path of ruin in your body. They do this by using some pretty interesting ingredients. Some of the common ones you might notice are charcoal and baking soda, neither of which sound super effective up front, but you may be surprised. Turns out baking soda is like a miracle substance that can whiten your teeth, neutralize odor, and reduce plaque. It's mildly abrasive and alkaline, which helps your teeth clean naturally while reducing the acidity. Toothpastes are typically more effective when they include baking soda and it's become a very popular ingredient in DIY tooth care because it's inexpensive, easy to access, and safe to eat in reasonable quantities. Then there's activated charcoal. This one is a bit interesting because there's 
like reasons why it would be helpful for your mouth, but the evidence isn't super conclusive at this point in time. Activated charcoal is a fine grain powder made from natural materials like wood and coconut shells oxidized at high temperatures. It is highly absorbent and has long been used in a variety of ways to absorb and remove toxins and can be found in a bunch of medical settings from air purifiers, water filters, and more. It is one of the latest fads used in all sorts of beauty products for this reason. And in the case of toothpaste, some of these claims might be true. It may help reduce bad breath and clear up stains on your teeth, but it's not entirely clear what else it's doing, good or bad. There are reasons to be a little careful with this one as it's more abrasive than necessary and may wear down your enamel with regular use, which is why some people opt for a charcoal mouthwash instead. But one of the complaints that you will see about many toothpastes that contain these two ingredients is that they do not contain any fluoride. The fear is that if you switch to a more natural option, you may not get as deep of a clean, which is probably true of the natural option if it avoids fluoride. Baking soda is great, but it's not going to be as effective without that fluoride boost. If we've been through a lot here, so what do you do? Well, the first option is obvious and you're not gonna like it. The only reason that we need toothpaste in the first place is because our diet is trash. So the best thing that you could do to take care of your teeth is to not eat as much sugar and starch and carbs and everything. Sadly, I know that's not going to be the sexy option and I'm sorry. The reality is that as long as you are brushing your teeth, you're probably already doing the right thing. It's so easy to get bogged down in the details of one thing or another. To fluoride or not to fluoride doesn't really matter if you are still eating like shit and not brushing your teeth. I know this is not a conclusive answer and I feel like a dad right now, but hopefully this video has been helpful. And if it has, thank you so much for watching. Give it a like, subscribe to the channel, and we will see you in the next one.